have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Have you ever yeah. Felt? Are you listening? Welcome back to Mr. Miller's classroom videos and Today we're going to talk about the Cold War at home and the American dream in the 1950s. And appropriately our background slide is a suburban home uh, with what seems to be a family or friends about to go out for a day. Uh, and we have the classic 1950s car um, in the driveway. And this is uh, what our viewpoint uh, or our stereotypical view of the 1950s and 60s to an extent is um, the suburban life with the car uh, and the beautiful manicured lawn and the nice house and, and that's what we think the 1950s and 60s it was like in the, in the United States but it wasn't always like that and that's what we're gonna see today <coughs> The American Dream of the 1950s, Paranoia in Suburbia, by yours truly. <coughs> to start off with, if we're going to talk about the 1950s, we really need to talk about the communist witch hunt. And we hear the word witch hunt being thrown all around a lot these days. Uh, but, you know, basically it's a hunt for something that doesn't exist. We had this fear of communism, and we've gone over this before in class. During the early Cold War, Americans were afraid of communism spreading. The USSR controlled Eastern Europe, and China fell to communists in 1949, and was the U.S. going to be next? We were afraid. President Harry Truman, in March 1947, set up his Loyalty Review Board to investigate government employees. From 1947 to 1951, the board looked at 3.2 million people, but only dismissed 212. So, proportionally speaking, not a whole lot of communists to be found. This picture of uh, President Truman here, our 33rd president. Another investigator of communists was the House Un-American Activities Committee. This was HUAC. H-U-A-C. Uh, it was led partly by future President Richard Nixon, Alger Hiss, and the Hollywood Ten were called before HUAC, and these were suspected communists who suffered because uh, of their affiliations. Here's a couple pictures. You see Alger Hiss on the left and um, the Hollywood Ten on the right. Hollywood Ten were basically Hollywood producers and directors who had supposedly communist ties, and after they were called before who act they were blacklisted they were kept from finding work in the united states alger hiss was a uh, supported supposed spy um, for the communists and uh basically we saw uh with alger hiss the end of his career after he was uh, questioned by richard nixon and who the most famous communist hunter was Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, and you've heard his name before, I hope. Elected to the Senate in 1946, McCarthy would rise to power by making accusations against supposed communists. He seldom had proof, but would use intimidation to get results, and this became known by the term McCarthyism. Here's a, a picture of Joseph McCarthy here. At first, millions of Americans liked McCarthy, and he was seen as a patriot, defending the country from uh, the evil scourge of the Red Communists. But in 1954, things changed. McCarthy accused the U.S. Army of communist subversion. Taking on the Army was a bit too much. In televised hearings, Army lawyer Joseph Welch embarrassed the senator. The Senate would then censure him, that censure McCarthy, and he lost most of his followings followers. Now what we're going to do is see a little video to kind of flesh out the details here. And this is from the History Channel, um, all about what you need to know to understand Joseph McCarthy. This is Yahoo Williams. I'm a historian. And here's what you need to know in order to sound smart about Joseph McCarthy. 
During the 1940s and 1950s, many Americans worried about the prospects of communism rearing its head within the United States. Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin was one of the key political figures to capitalize on these fears. In 1950, he gave a salacious speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, in which he claimed to have evidence of 250 communists active in the United States Department of State. Despite the lack of evidence corroborating McCarthy's claims, he nevertheless continued to captivate the American public for the next five years. During this period, McCarthy hurled allegations that well-known authors, activists, and government officials were actually traitors and communist sympathizers. This was known as red baiting and often consisted of McCarthy hurling allegations of suspected communist involvement and forcing people to respond and to defend their innocence, even though they had not been proven guilty. It's not until McCarthy turned his attention to the United States Army in 1954 that his reign of terror came to an end and he was censured by the United States Senate. The American people were treated to the full terror of McCarthyism after the Army hearings were televised. In an infamous exchange during those televised hearings in which McCarthy attacked a young Army officer, the Army's chief counsel thundered at the senator, have you no sense of decency, sir, which encapsulated the turn against McCarthy in this period. By the time the televised Army hearings ended, McCarthy lost much of his popular support. He died in 1957, just a short time later, at the age of 48. Young people in large numbers came out. Okay. Now back to our slideshow. And you can see there that McCarthy, thankfully, his reign of terror did not last too long. <coughs> Another thing that Americans were deathly afraid of was the atomic bomb and the use of the atomic bomb in warfare. Um... This was perhaps even more pressing to them than communism because it was more real. They knew what uh, was coming. There were two types of bombs to fear. The A-bomb was a fission bomb, which created an explosion by splitting an atom. The H-bomb, or hydrogen bomb, was a fusion bomb, which created an explosion by combining two atoms together. That was much more powerful than the A-bomb. Um, I'm not going to show you the video here, but the Tsar bomb created by the Soviet Union was in a hydrogen bomb, and it was the most powerful bomb ever tested um, by any country on Earth. Here's just some basic diagram to show you how fission and fusion work. And of course, a fusion bomb is much, much more powerful than a fission bomb. Here you can see the Tsar bomb as it relates to some other explosions we've seen or heard of in history. The Tsar bomb, uh, in comparison to the Castle Bravo test, a test the U.S. carried out, as well as the Mike bomb, which was carried out. But there you see in this little circle here, um, the Trinity test and the Hiroshima test, the Hiroshima bombing. Uh, a bunker buster was a type of bomb used during the Second Iraq War in the uh, early 2000s. And we can see um, that even huge uh, explosions like Hiroshima, and, and, we, and we hope we remember our World War II studies, we know the power of that bomb, uh, are dwarfed compared to the H-bomb, the Tsar bomb uh, that the Soviet Union created. The U.S. and the USSR were constantly in a state of competition over the quality and quantity of their nuclear weapons, and they practiced brinksmanship, which is threatening an enemy with massive retaliation for any aggression. Here you can see uh, the nuclear stockpiles estimated from 1950 to 2000 in thousands of weapons. Um, so at a peak, the word world total... Uh, about the before early 1980s was about 70, not quite 70,000 nuclear weapons, uh, with the Soviet Union peaking at the same time. The U.S. Uh, peaked a little bit over 30,000 weapons um, in the late uh, in the early 1960s.
The fear over a nuclear war caused the federal government to create the Civil Defense Administration, which created cartoons like Bert the Turtle to teach students what to do during an attack and called on people to build bomb shelters to evacuate to. We're going to switch out again, and this time we're going to watch a little civil defense video uh, called Duck and Cover, all about um, protecting yourself from a nuclear attack. We're not going to watch the whole thing, we're going to watch just a, a excerpt from it. Civil Defense Film, produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. Produced by Archer Productions, Incorporated. Okay, and so the idea was basically to get on your hands and uh, knees, cover the back of your head, get under your desk, and protect from a nuclear bomb. Uh, protect yourself from a nuclear bomb. But as time goes on and bombs get more and more powerful, people basically realize that if you're close enough to an explosion, there's nothing you can really do to protect yourself. Um, and we don't necessarily do these much anymore. Uh, also, again, people would build bomb shelters in their backyards and they would use those to evacuate to. Here you can see an ad for a, a fallout shelter. Your one defense against nuclear fallout, building a shelter in your backyard. And you can see the logo here, CD stands for Civil Defense. Here is uh, inside of one of those fallout shelters and you can see bunk beds uh, for the family to sleep on and also canned food, a radio, uh, things that they would need if they were going to be stuck underground for a long time waiting for fallout, new radioactive fallout to clear away. <coughs> working for the American dream in the 1950s. We're going to move away from the, the fear mongering for a little bit and we're going to focus on the, uh, what the American dream was in the 1950s. By 1956, most Americans did not hold blue collar or industrial manufacturing jobs. They instead had held white collar jobs, which called upon people to perform clerical, managerial, professional tasks, such as accounting. And we can see here, it's not to say that a uh, blue collar job disappeared because they were still a huge part of um, our job sector. But white collar jobs uh, passed them in 19, again, 1956. Um, here you can see the guy on the left is a, a blue collar worker. The guy on the right is a white collar worker, although it's obviously the same guy with just different uniform on. If you had a white collar job or a blue collar job, you might have worked for something called a conglomerate. A conglomerate is a major corporation which includes a number of smaller companies in unrelated industries. Some examples of conglomerates from the 1950s, which are still around today, General Motors. Uh, they have several different companies like Cadillac, Chevrolet, Pontiac. They are all were part of the General Motors brand. General Electric. Another current day example would be Walt Disney. And here we see three different logos for three different conglomerates, General Electric, Walt Disney, and General Motors. And each of these have their own uh, companies that come under the conglomerate's umbrella. Um, for example, Walt Disney would have Lucasfilm, which creates Star Wars, and, and Marvel, which does the Avengers movies. Um, and, and these are all, you know, huge companies which have an international reach. Successful white collar workers were to try to expand their business through the use of a franchise. Uh, it's a company that offers similar products or services in many locations. And a franchise, many examples out there, um, TJ Maxx, Wendy's, Pizza Hut, um, 
Best Buy, these are all franchises. Uh, this term also refers to the right of an individual to do business using a parent's company's name and product. So if you want to do business using those franchises' uh, logos and their names, then you yeah, have to have agreement first. One of the men who uh, created, or uh, should I say, uh, maybe not created, but developed this idea was Ray Kroc, and uh, he was the founder of McDonald's. And here's a picture of Ray Kroc with one of the original McDonald's in the background there. And I want to show you just a short little video about him talking about the name uh, McDonald's and, and what it meant to him. To me, it was all uh, inclusive. It was Irish to the Irish. It sounded Scotch to the Scotch. Uh, it was a typical uh, English-American word. It flowed. McDonald's. It was easy for the kids to say and remember. And uh, I liked the sound of it. It sounded uh, wholesome and it sounded genuine, you know. Uh, I don't like these uh, mm, gimmick type names, you know. Uh, burger this and burger that and uh, all that kind of stuff. McDonald's, it's got a nice sounding name. It sounds like Tiffany's. And I think we are the Tiffany's of the hamburger business. Yeah, um, Tiffany's is a very expensive jewelry company. And um, it uh, maybe does not compare so well to McDonald's. Uh, Tiffany's is high end, very expensive. McDonald's, you know, not very high end. Uh, maybe back in his time period, closer to the founding of McDonald's was like that, but I don't think so today. Um, if you want to go out to eat and eat something nice, you probably don't go to McDonald's, but um, that is, is, I guess, completely up to your own tastes. <coughs> I'm going to talk about conformity in suburban life. Uh, white collar bosses expected their employees to act and dress a certain way. And they did not want individuals, they wanted people to be the same and to conform. And you might still see this at a, a bank today. They, some banks maybe don't want you to have a tattoo or maybe have your tattoos covered up so that when people see you at the uh, teller or, or at the desk, then they uh, don't think badly of you. Uh, that's just one thing that uh, different businesses might do. But it was even more severe back in the 1950s. Conformity was not only seen in the working world during the 1950s, but also in the suburbs. And you can see this in the cookie cutter housing developments such as Levittown, New York. And here's a picture of a Levittown house in the upper right hand corner with the, you know, family there. Um, and the house looks good enough, but then if you look at the picture in the left hand corner, it's the house, but they're all the same. Same yard, same style house, no variation, roads look all the same. Very easy to maybe get lost in, in that, uh, you know, conformity jungle there. Um, but these were, that was, the, that was the time. That was what people wanted. For many, suburban life was the American dream. Everyone rushed to buy products such as washing machines. Um, and they could have a single family house. They could have safe neighborhoods, privacy, a place to start a fami family. And they were conforming. They were all being the same, but it, they were paying this price for security. So yeah, conformity seemed a small price to pay for security and certainty in their lives. And this generation, which had come through the Great Depression, had come through World War II, um, they needed some security, they needed some stability. <coughs> it's about kids in the 1950s, because of course this is right in the middle of the baby boom. And um, the number of children, it was exploding. Um, during the 1950s, the U.S. population increased by 30 million, um, and we know that it increased even higher uh, if we count from the years from 1946 to 1964, which is usual time period the baby boom is considered to have taken place in. Other reasons for the baby boom include after-war reunions, uh, decreasing marriage age, and desire for large families. So if you feel safe, you're going to feel safe enough to have kids. If you missed your uh, your girlfriend or your boyfriend during the war, after war reunions, people getting married at earlier ages, and they want to have big families because they couldn't do that in the Great Depression. There's a picture of a little baby. This is my daughter, Ada, uh, Emiliana, who is not so much a little baby anymore. That's when she was little. 
All around the country, people tried to help these kids. New drugs were created to save kids from diseases. Dr. Jonas Salk developed a vaccine for polio, and later Dr. Albert Sabin made an oral vaccine. Here's a picture of Salk on the uh, left there. Dr. Benjamin Spock laid down guidelines for raising kids in his book, The Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, and he did something very different than um, what had been done up to that point. He urged parents to stop hitting kids. He, he said that uh, the old biblical reference of spare the rod and spoil the child was, n was not appropriate, and that if you hit kids, you're going to do damage to them. So this was something new at that time. There's a picture of uh, Dr. Spock. TV shows such as Mickey Mouse Club were made for kids. Here's a picture of the Mickey Mouse Club, and you can see uh, the group. This is the original Mickey Mouse Club in the 1950s. It's been recreated several times in several decades since then, but this is the original Mickey Mouse Club. Public school districts were constantly creating new campuses to accommodate the over 10 million students which entered elementary schools during the 1950s. And what we're going to do now is just uh, go back to videos for a second. And I want to show you uh, the Mickey Mouse Club intro from the uh, 1950s. And so you see there, that was the original uh, Mouseketeers. Um, with all these kids uh, coming into schools, uh, they needed uh, more teachers. There was a teacher shortage in the 50s. You can see this cartoon here. Um, it shows a, a mother bringing her child into school. And it says, be sure to give mine special attention. Well, there's no way you can give a kid special attention. I can speak... Uh, from experience when you have that many kids in a classroom. It's very, very difficult, and that's why the teacher looks so tired there. <laughs> Talking about the women in the 1950s, and women were expected to fill their traditional roles and live and work in the home. And this is the traditional stereotypical view of the woman here, uh, bringing snacks or waffles, maybe waffles out for breakfast, dressed in an apron and a house dress. Uh, women were discouraged from attending college as men were not interested in women with college degrees, but in women who were, quote, warm and human. Again, very stereotypical. Uh, a woman can't be both uh, educated and warm. Many women questioned their traditional roles, though. This included writer Betty Friedan, whose landmark book, The Feminine Mystique, spoke out for women who weren't satisfied with their homemaker lives. They thought they could have a career instead, or they could have both if they wanted. It's a picture of uh, Betty Friedan, uh, she lived from 1921 to 2006. Women did participate in the workforce during the 1950s, but they were confined to traditional secretarial and clerical jobs. Those of lower economic status were often forced to take jobs and continue their roles as homemaker, forcing women into a sort of double duty because men weren't supposed to do home. 
the work at home, the cleaning, the cooking, the things like that. So women, if they had to take a job, had to do both, which obviously is not fair. <coughs> Our next slide is about car culture and consumerism, and we really have to understand the importance of cars if we're going to understand the 1950s. To live in the suburbs meant that you needed an automobile. Uh, as most people who live in the suburbs work in the cities, new car sales rose from 6.7 million in 1950 to 7.9 million in 1955, just a few years later. And there's a 1957 Chevrolet, sweet, smooth, and sassy, again, an advertisement here you can see. Um, and if you got one you want to sell to me for the original price, I'll be more than glad to buy it. Um, now, to help car culture spread, and to facilitate travel, we built the Interstate Highways. It's part of the Interstate Highway Act, signed by Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. A uh, response to the need for roads for all cars to travel on. It connected suburbs to the cities and allowed people to move to the suburbs. It was also uh, built uh, with a defensive, uh, a military uh, purpose in mind. The des design of it was such that if we were attacked, we could move our military hardware and troops across the country easily, or if population centers were destroyed by, say, nuclear weapons, um, then you could evacuate the city quickly. It's a picture of uh, President Eisenhower. While the use of cars in interstates did increase mobility, it also increased accidents, traffic jams, and air and noise pollution. It also increased the poverty of the inner city as more people moved, and, and we'll talk more about that shortly. Being part of suburban life also meant buying consumer goods. Many products were available in the 50s, such as blenders, freezers, TVs, and record players. Often producers would make products which were designed to wear out or become outdated, and by doing this, they caused consumers to buy more products. This was called planned obsolescence. And to find out about planned obsolescence, you don't need to look any farther than cell phones. If you can take a look at them here, these are a bunch of old cell phones, some of which I actually had when I started my adult, my adult life. Um, they're all obsolete now. No one would use these anymore. Um, but it was designed that way. It was designed to get you to keep coming back to spend more money and buy the newest, neatest uh, cell phone with the best new features. Cars are very similar too. Advertisers would take advantage of the nation's desire to spend. Ads were placed everywhere. By 1950, $9 billion a year were spent on ads. And we can see here um, different ads. Rocket skates uh, from a magazine selling you uh, inline skates for $6.95. Uh, meat. Um, <laughs> trying to get you to buy meat for your dinner. And Frosted Flakes with Tony and the Tiger obviously have changed a little bit uh, since then. <coughs> Talk about pop culture in the 1950s, and that's affected by many things. First, we have regulation of pop culture with the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, still around today, licensed TV, phone, and radio. You might be familiar with FCC from discussions on net neutrality. Um, the use of TV would increase rapidly during the 50s. By 1956, 500 new TV stations have been licensed. Types of programs included comedies like I Love Lucy, news broadcasts like See It Now, sitcoms like Leave It to Beaver, uh, violent adventure shows like Gunsmoke. Here you can see uh, Leave it to Beaver on the left, uh, See it now in the middle, and Gunsmoke, it's a western on the right. Some thought radio and movies might not survive, but radio stations turned to local shows and remained popular. Movies also survived TV, too. Uh, movies are bigger, brighter, and they sounded better than TV. New innovations to smell vision 3D films, and Cinemascope also attracted audience. smell vision has kind of disappeared. That's on the right here. Um, smell vision re literally released scents into the air in the theater while you sat there, and you got to a certain part of the movie, like you saw a skunk in the movie, and it would release the scent of a skunk. Um, or you saw a rose, you would smell a rose. On the left, we see the uh, 3D, uh, 3D uh, films, and the glasses you wear, and yeah, that's not too different from what we experience today when we pay a few extra dollars to go see a 3D movie. Many people did not agree with the accepted values of the 1950s, though. They rejected suburban life. They were part of the beat movement. These were known as beats or beatniks, kind of like the forerunners to hippies of the 60s. Allen Ginsberg's poem Howl in 1956 and Jack Kerouac's novel On the Road in 1957 illustrated the beliefs of beatniks. <coughs> 
We're going to talk about pop culture. We're going to talk about rock and roll because this art form would begin in the 1950s. Um, it was coined, the phrase rock and roll was coined by a Cleveland, Ohio DJ, Alan Freed. Rock and roll is a combination of jazz, rhythm and blues, country and pop music. It was made by black artists, white artists. It's uniquely American in its style. Um, one of the reasons we have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland is because Alan Freed was from Cleveland and he coined the term. Stars such as Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, they would all be some of the originators of the genre. Little Richard on the left, Chuck Berry in the middle, and Jerry Lee Lewis on the right. Perhaps nobody else, though, uh, really contributed to it as much as rock and roll star Elvis Presley. He borrowed from other stars and genres to create his own unique style, which brought criticism for its rebellious lyrics and suggested dancing, especially from parents. There was really a, a generation gap between parents who didn't like rock and roll and their kids in the 50s who did. There's a picture of Elvis there, young Elvis. And we have to understand though, that a lot of white stars, especially Elvis, for example, borrowed or maybe you can even say stole from black stars. African-American musicians like Big Mama Thornton, Nat King Cole, and jazz musicians Miles Davis would pave the way for rock and roll. However, the work of many of these black musicians would remain largely unknown. Big Mama Thornton was actually the first one to record Hound Dog, uh, which we obviously associate with Elvis Presley because that was one of his big hits, but he wasn't the first. Um, he, take, he took it the, the song, he changed the beat, and uh, made a lot of money off it, whereas Big Mama Thornton, who recorded it at first, only made a, um, a few hundred dollars. Uh, with the exception of a few like Nat King Cole, many black stars were just ignored. The U.S. of the 1950s remained largely segregated. And on the left, we can see Nat King Cole, uh, one of the first uh, blacks to uh, have his own TV show, I believe. And also um, Big Mama Thornton on the left with the harmonica. <coughs> The other America, so this leads us into our last slide. Although the suburbs prospered in the 50s, many still lived in poverty. By 1962, one out of every four people in the U.S. was living below the poverty line. And one contributor to this poverty was white flight. Whites, middle-class whites, would leave the cities, and they would move into the suburban areas. And then cities lost people, they lost the businesses those people ran, and they lost revenue. They lost tax revenue because those people paid property and income taxes, and they took that with them when they left the cities for the suburbs. Cities could no longer provide the services the residents needed, like um, police or fire or ambulance or trash pickup, things like that, would be cut as the city's population decreased. Uh, we moved from city, as you can see on the left, to suburbs. And whether or not uh, people live in poverty is determined by the poverty line, a calculated amount of income for specific families. For example, the poverty line for a family of four in 2010 was $22,314 a year. It's gone up in the past years because of inflation, but it's still within the, I believe, the $20,000 range. Minorities were especially affected as they often moved into the inner cities as whites were moving out. So minorities were stuck in the inner cities, decaying inner cities, while whites enjoyed life in the suburbs. Very few blacks, Hispanics, or Native Americans got to enjoy life in the suburbs like whites did. And this just uh, emphasizes the inequality present in America at this time. We're still segregated. We're still having problems. And it's not until the civil rights movement that these things start to change. <coughs> And so the deceptive peace of the 1950s would not last. The chaotic 60s would change the United States in many ways for the better. And that concludes uh, our slideshow over America in the 1950s, paranoia in suburbia. I, I hope you enjoyed it and learned uh, a little bit more about your United States history. Uh, this is Mr. Miller signing out.